So, with that being said, we're, uh, we're going to dive into God's Word, as I uh, prefaced earlier. We're going to be in John chapter 1. We're going to be finishing out the chapter as we were last. We saw the very beginning last week. And uh, just to give you, as you're turning in there, give you a little preface. The book of John has an overarching theme, and it is uh, that we may believe. John wrote this so that we may believe. And there are things within this Bible, uh, this, this book of God's Word, that uh, we gain understanding on who Christ himself is. Um, again, I broke this down last week, but I'm going to reiterate it. Is in Matthew, we see Christ's kingship. In Mark, we see Christ's servanthood. In Luke, we see Christ's manhood. And in John, we see Christ's godhood. We see who he is as being part of the three, right? We talked about that last week. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. We talked about that and what that looks like. We talked about the greatness of Christ's person being revealed in His light. And once accepted, it provides His grace. That's what we talked about last week. And it's important for us to recognize and understand that um, as we dive into this passage together. Carl did a wonderful job in praying um, over uh, this our, our service and what's taking place. But it's important also uh, to recognize where where we gain this understanding of who Jesus is. And it, and it starts off in chapter 1 with John the Baptist. And now it doesn't give us a lot of John the Baptist's background in the book of John. So if you go back to the book of Luke, it gives you the background on, the who, on where John came from. And John the Baptist is a very unique person. A very unique person. And a very, uh, a very called person. And we'll dive into that a little bit more. But just to give you, if you don't know the history of John the Baptist, just to give you a little bit of that history, um, John the Baptist is a descendant of Zechariah and Elizabeth from the tribe of Levi, and his parents were elderly as well as childless. So it, it's often that we don't look at that picture so clearly as that his parents were very or, or were older and past those prime bearing children years, and uh, and they didn't have any children. So they get to this place where uh, Zechariah, he was one who performed priestly duties of service, of offering incense and, and sacrifice in these, these priestly duties that he did. That's who Zechariah was. And what's interesting is according to the, the Gospel of Luke, Zechariah was told that Elizabeth was going to bear a son and that he was to be named John. And what's interesting is when Zechariah was told this, he didn't believe it. Okay, can we reiterate what just took place? An angel of the Lord stood directly in front of him and said, your wife is going to bear a son and you're going to name him John. And he didn't believe it. I think, I think we as, as churchgoers, especially ones who have been raised in the church, we can be so blinded because we see God so much around us that we're not exactly paying attention to maybe what God is doing in the midst of it. That we become numb to miracles that God does in and of itself. It's important that we recognize that. And I, I think it's, uh, it's important that we, we, we take note from what Zechariah did. And so with that, with him not believing, the, uh, the angel Gabriel made him mute, meaning that he couldn't speak. And since he wasn't able to speak, uh, he wasn't able to, I, I can't imagine, especially you know, me, I, I can't imagine being mute. That would be really troublesome, especially as a pastor. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but I think it's, it's interesting um, in how this came about. And it's it's also interesting to look at the life of Elizabeth. Now, Elizabeth was uh, this cousin of Mary, the mother of Jesus. And when they, both of them were, were pregnant, we know, in, based off of Luke, that uh, when Elizabeth came, that she, uh, she was about five months further along than, than, uh, than Elizabeth was, or uh, than Mary was, I'm sorry. And, uh, and so we know that because when Mary had just heard about when the angel appeared to her, she came and and inside of Elizabeth's womb, John the Baptist leapt when Mary walked in the room. So there's, there's instances of what we're going to be looking at based off of who John was um, at that, that very beginning. When Elizabeth said this, she, she knew it. She knew it, right? Because she had been appeared by Gabriel as well. And, and she blessed Mary by saying, that blessed, is, blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And we see Mary's response being on the beautiful Magnificat that is written that she basically says, my soul magnifies the Lord. 
beautiful picture of what we see in uh, what is taking place here between the two lives. When Elizabeth gave birth to John the Baptist, uh, they, it's always the father's duty to tell the name of the child. Well, Zechariah couldn't speak, so he writes it down on a tablet that his name is going to be John. And when he writes it down, his ability to speak comes instantly back. And so, but it, then it goes into the beautiful picture of what takes place afterwards is that Zechariah sings and praises God in the midst of that. He recognized in the midst of his learning that, that he was going to be used, that John was going to be used as a blessing to the Lord. You also see, based off of John the Baptist, John, there was nobody like John. Nobody like John. You know, we read throughout, a, a based off of who he was, we see that he is one that wore a camel's hair, and he, he lived out in the wilderness, and he fed off of locusts and honey, right? Now, locusts like the bug, right? <laughs> and honey, which is the only way I could eat a bug. Um, <laughs> But what's interesting is that I, I think growing up, we, we hear this, we know this, but here's what's interesting is that we think, oh, that's, I guess that's normal if you live in the wilderness. No, it was weird then, just like it's weird now, okay? It was weird then. So when you think of John the Baptist, don't think, oh, it was this kind of crazy guy that lived in the woods and ate bugs and honey. Yeah, because that's weird, right? But, but he came with this message, and we're going to be talking about that this morning, that he was preaching through the years, and, and as he's doing this, this freak, basically, as he's walking around sharing this story, that, that here comes the one to whom is going to save the world. And he, as he's doing this, this, this story is changing people's perspective. And so a large multitudes come and follow and listen to what he has to say. And he is going and he's baptizing. And we'll, we'll be talking about that in just a minute. But I want us to understand this, that even if you go back and look at Matthew, it says that the impact of John the Baptist was so strong that even Herod almost believed. Interesting. His, his story of what he was sharing was so powerful that it even drove Herod, who is known as a very wicked, wicked man, it almost drove him to believing what was taking place. There's an impact on with the good news that John had to share. And that's our overarching theme that I want us to, to think about this morning. As followers of Jesus, we are called to be messengers of the good news. You can boil the rest of chapter 1 into that one statement. But there's a lot of different things that go along with it that we're going to be diving in together. We're going to be reading verses... And I to 28 um, of John chapter 1. And we see the first thing that we're looking at together is Jesus' messenger, right? Jesus' messenger. All right, and in verse 19, it starts off with this. It says, Now this was John's testimony when the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem sent priests and Levites to ask him who he was. He did not fail to confess, but confessed freely. I am not the Messiah. They asked him, well, then who are you? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Or are you a prophet? He answered, no. Finally, they asked, well, who are you? Give us an answer to take back to those that have sent us. What do you say about yourself? John replied in the words of Isaiah, I am the voice of the one calling in the wilderness. Make straight the way for the Lord. Now the Pharisees, who had been sent 25, questioned him. Why then do you baptize if you're not the Messiah, nor Elijah, nor a prophet? I baptize with water, John replies. But among you stands one you do not know. He is the one who comes after me. The straps on who, of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. That's all happened at Bethany on the other side of the Jordan where John was baptizing. Interesting perspective that John starts immediately by denying, denying himself and pointing to Jesus. The Jewish leaders asked him the question, well, who are you? If you're not Elijah, you're not a prophet. 
And look at his beautiful response. When being questioned, what does he do? He points them directly to Scripture. As, as followers of Christ, as Jesus' messengers, we are to be pointing others back to who God is throughout Scripture, pointing it back to the Bible. John does this and shares Isaiah 40, verse 3, which was written 700 years before this took place. What an amazing feat. An amazing feat. And basically, he said, I, I'm just a voice. I'm just a voice. Now, we, we see even through what Jesus thinks of John later on, that he's, <laughs> he's more than just a voice. But look, at that's the picture that John exclaims in who he is. First thing I want us to recognize is that Jesus' followers, Jesus' messengers, that's what we're talking about, they start by denying themselves. That's who we are. We're Jesus' messengers. As a follower of Jesus Christ, we are his messenger. We are the one to whom is bringing about the message of the good news of Jesus Christ. And in response to that, we are to deny ourselves. You see, John shows humility in the process, which is exactly what Jesus thinks of such denial as John's. Look at Matthew 11, verse 11. It says this, Truly I tell you, among those born of women, there have has not risen anyone greater than John the Baptist. Yet whoever is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. What a picture. Did you catch that? Jesus says, there's no one greater than John the Baptist. In the, in the, not, I, I think it's not as much the person as much as the job. There's no greater job that we have as messengers of Jesus Christ is to share the story of who Jesus is. There's no greater story. There isn't. And it's important that we recognize that's our job. As a follower of Jesus, we are to share the message of Jesus Christ. Let nothing get in the way. Let nothing get in the middle. Don't allow our fear of not knowing the answers. Don't allow our fear of man to get in the middle. We are called to be followers of Jesus. And in that, we share the message of the good news of Jesus Christ. That's exactly who John the Baptist was. But I love the picture of who he was. He was full of spiritual commitment. He was filled with the Spirit even before birth. He faced great temptation, but to his credit, he never took any of it. He never took any of it. You see, great witnessing starts by never taking credit off of the one to whom we are witnessing. John was an excellent witness. In 2 Corinthians 4, verse 5, it says this, For what we preach is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, and ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. A servant of Christ does not exalt himself. I read this story this week about a great conductor by the name of Artura Tiscani. And he said that as he was conducting... Um, Beethoven's ninth, ninth Symphony, right? As he's conducting this Ninth Symphony, he had done uh, what he had done, and everyone, when he got done, everyone was clapping and cheering and whistling, you know, great job. And to, to what is heard by those that were there, this is his greatest production and his greatest performance. And by one person who was there witnessed that evening, that as he finished, he turned around to the orchestra, the ones who had just done what he had conducted. And he said, gentlemen, I am nothing, but Beethoven is everything, everything, everything. He took, he took the one to whom he was sharing about and said, this is not about me, but, but about the one who wrote the story, who wrote the song. And as I heard that, I thought, boy, what a picture of how we're to respond. It is not about me. It's not about you. It's about the one to whom we're sharing about. It's about that Jesus is everything, everything, everything. The very same picture. What a response. That is the attitude towards Jesus Christ that we are to have. And John the Baptist's attitude as a messenger was spot on. I think it's important for us to recognize that. 
The second part is looking at verses 29 to 42. It's, it's two different sections that we're going to combine together, but it's, it is exactly what the story of Jesus was. Number two point is, is Jesus' message. What does that look like? Let's read verses 29 to 42. The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is the one I meant when I said, a man who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. I myself did not know him. But the reason I came baptizing with water was that he might be revealed to Israel. Then John gave his testimony. I saw the Spirit come down from heaven as a dove and remain on him. And I myself did not know him, but the one who sent me to baptize with water told me, the man on whom you see the Spirit come down and remain is the one whom who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. I have not seen him. I testify that this is God's chosen one. Verse 35. The next day John was there again with two of his disciples. When he saw Jesus pass by, he said, Look, the Lamb of God. When the two disciples heard him said this, they followed Jesus. Turning around, Jesus saw them and asked, What do you want? They said, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? Come, he replied, and you will see. So they went and saw there he was staying, where he was staying. And they spent time with him. And it was about four in the afternoon. Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, the one of the two who heard what John had said and who had followed Jesus, the first thing Andrew did was to find his brother Simon and tell him, we have found the Messiah, that is the Christ, and we have brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, You are Simon, son of John. You will be called Cephas, which is translated as Peter. We see the entire message of Jesus summed up in one verse, and that's in verse 29. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. There's the message of Jesus right there. Very simple. You see, we can, we, can, we can think through and think, oh man, I don't have all the answers. How can I share about the, the love of Jesus when I, I could be asked a question where I don't know the answer? And that, that could very well be true. And I think a great response, if, if you are ever stumped by something, just saying, I don't know, is a very good start. Say, I don't know, but I'll do research and I'll, I want to come back and follow up. See, that's the kind of witnessing that speaks because you're willing to do work to show them that what you're saying is that it matters to you and you want to share that with those people. That's the very answer. Don't allow things to get in the way. I don't know the answer, but I'm willing to research and find out for you. I got, as I got older as a child, my parents would give, uh, give us little ornaments that we would save in a box for when we got married and to put on our tree. And my mom was real good in finding ones that, uh, that, that had a lot of meaning. And I remember one that, uh, that we have to this day. And it's a, it's a picture of a lamb standing, uh, or that is laying at the feet of a lion. And it's, and it's it, just a picture of when I think about it, I think of the, the sacrifice of the lamb to which that's who Jesus is but he's also the lion, the one who is in charge. And what a picture we see of, of exactly this Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. You see, the Lamb represents the offering that had to be made for our sin, right? The Lamb of God was slain on our behalf, was perfect. His name is Jesus, and he, his sacrifice, paid it all for all mankind. We see this written hundreds of years before in Isaiah chapter 53 verses 6 and 7 that say we all like sheep have gone astray each of us has turned to his own way and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all he was oppressed and afflicted yet 
He did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep before his shears is silent. So he did not open his mouth. You see, we see that the picture of Christianity is it's a, it's a bloody religion. <laughs> Think about it. It's very. But what is taking place, the blood of Christ is the, what cleanses us all from our sin. It's the blood of Jesus. And, and this is the primary reality of our witness. Yes, Jesus came to give us abundant life. Yes, absolutely. Yes, Jesus performed miracles. And he can perform miracles in our lives. And those are great things. But that's not the gospel. The gospel is that Jesus paid for our sins. Let's not be confused that the benefits are what the gospel is. The benefits are what comes based off of our belief in the blood that was sacrificed on our behalf. That's who Jesus is. You see, we see this through that the Lamb is the eternal message that it is prophesied about in Genesis. It is personified through Isaiah, which we just read. It's identified it here in John, which we just read last week. And it's going to be magnified in Revelation. Look at Revelation chapter 5, verses 9 through 14. It should be up on the screen. And they sang a new song saying, You are worthy to take the scroll and on and to open its seals because you were slain. And with your blood, you purchased for God persons from every tribe and language and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve over God and they will reign on the earth. Then I looked and heard a voice of the many angels numbering thousands upon thousands and 10,000 times 10,000. They encircled the throne and the living creatures and all of the elders. In a loud voice, they were saying, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. Then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all that is in them singing to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be honor and pow- be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshiped. We see it all throughout Scripture. Guys, that's the reason we have this. Because it points directly back to who Jesus is. And that is the way that our lives are to look as followers of Jesus. They are to point back to Jesus every time. Every time. Anytime God gives us an opportunity to share, take advantage of it. Because if you're a follower of Jesus, somebody was willing to do that for you. We can, we can see beautiful lives lived out as a reflection of Jesus, but ultimately someone had to tell you about him for us to believe in who he is. It's important that we see this. In verses 31 to 33, back to John chapter 1, we see John the Baptist share about Jesus. Even though he didn't completely know him, He is willing to be obedient to the message so that Jesus would be proclaimed to all of Israel. He was willing to do that. You see, Jesus' message is to be shared by his messengers and is good news for all. It's important that we recognize that. Lastly, the third thing we're going to look at is Jesus' followers, verses 43 to 51. Jesus is Father. This is what it says in God's Word, verse 43. The next day, Jesus decided to leave for Galilee. Finding Philip, he said to him, Follow me, Peter, like Andrew and uh, Philip, like Andrew and Peter, was from the town of Bethsaida. Philip found Nathanael and told him, We have found the one, the one Moses spoke about in the law, and about whom the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nazareth. Can anything good come from there? Nathanael asked. Come and see, said Philip. 
When Jesus saw Nathanael approaching, he said to him, Here truly is an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. How do you know me? Nathanael asked. Jesus answered, I saw you while you were still under a fig tree before Philip called you. Then Nathanael declared, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Jesus said, You believe because I told you I saw you under a fig tree and you will see greater things than that. And he added, Very truly, I tell you, you will see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. In verse 43, we capture what a life of a follower looks like. And this is what it looks like. There's two things that we see throughout this. There's the life of the follower and the vision of the follower. And the first thing I want us to establish is this. And in verse 43, when Philip says, when Jesus asks Philip to follow him, he actually says, the original language means, you know, when we see Jesus walking and sees the disciples, he says, hey, come follow me. Like, that's the way we've always pictured it. But do you know what the original language means? When he says, follow me, it says, keep following me. It's not a one-time, follow me. It's a, keep following me. And I think that brings a picture to what our lives as, as response to the gospel looks like. It's not a, I make one decision, I set a prayer, therefore it's set, I'm good to go. It says, keep following me. And I think that's the picture of the gospel, of how we're to respond to it. Keep following me. When things get hard, keep following me. When you don't know the answers, keep following me. When things are, are tough at home, keep following me. When you lose your job, keep following me. When times are tough, keep following me. It's important that we recognize what the pressure of, of, of what we put on following Christ is when Jesus is just, keep following me. And I love that every response that we see throughout Scripture when Jesus called his disciples, again, disciples means the ones who are, to, are the ones who believe, are the followers, that's what disciple means. When Jesus called them, what did they do? They obeyed. They obeyed. Jesus' followers continue to follow. As a follower of Jesus Christ, if you've put your faith and trust and love in Jesus Christ, keep following. Wherever you are, keep following him. I just remember this picture, um, a little shout out to uh, my older son today, uh, uh, that today's his birthday. And uh, he's 11 today, so Titus, happy birthday. He's downstairs. Um, <laughs> but uh, I remember um, one of the joys of having little children is, is when you're away at work and coming back home. There's, there's no greater joy than uh, when your kids are little. I mean, if they like you, there's no greater joy. Um, <laughs> but I remember walking home, um, coming home and walking in and I see this the, my, my older son he was he was uh, you ever seen one of those walkers that you know those ones that have wheels that allow them to walk around they scoot you know going back and forth now something amazing about Titus is he he has he's gifted directionally and we could tell even at a young age right babe like even at a young age he would come ready to cut a corner and he'd realize that he's going to hit the wall and he would stop back up and do a roundabout so that he would go straight forward through it without crushing into the wall or the older two would slam into the wall every time. You know, they're the older one and the younger one. So we get this picture, right, of, of, of when I walk in the door coming back from work, and this is, this is who Titus is. He, he would come in, he'd see you, he'd go, he'd point, and he'd look around to share what he just saw. So he'd look around and say, Daddy, Daddy. Because he was trying to point to say, hey, there's Daddy. There's Daddy. And then he would come running towards you in a little walker. Quick. As I thought about that, isn't that supposed to be our response to God? We see him. We point to him. We recognize who he is. And we start telling everyone who he is. And then we go after him. 
That's our response to who Jesus is. See, claim, share, and follow. That's the gospel. It's simple. It's not as hard as we make it out to be. It's just follow him. Follow him. Then there's the second part that we see throughout this, this passage of the vision of the follower. And we see this in verse 51 in particular, but there's a background to it. There's a background that we see to verse 51. As, as Philip and Nathaniel are encountering who Jesus is, we see this, this vision of what takes place. And, and Jesus claims them and says that the angels of God are ascending and descending on the Son of Man. And so this goes back to Genesis 28. We can see the very same picture in Genesis 28 when Jacob is retreating because he's scared to death that his brother's going to take his life because he stole his birthright, which he had every right to be afraid of. And as he goes and he's been running and he gets, he gets, he's totally exhausted and he goes to take a nap because he's so tired. And as he does, God gives him this vision and he gives this vision of this ladder that is, that touches heaven and it touches heaven and then comes all the way down to earth. And on this ladder, he sees angels going back and forth, ascending and descending on them. And so this is the picture that what Jesus is claiming back to all the way back to the dream that Jacob had so many years ago, we see the very same picture that Nathaniel is being given by Jesus of where you will see angels ascending and descending. And so what does that tell us? What does that tell us? It's the vision of what a follower looks like. If we, when we get to the point to where we believe Jesus Christ is our Lord and Savior, we have now been given the ability to see the eternal. The picture of what the eternal looks like. And what does that look like? Is that we will see the opportunities that Jesus has to go to share between about heaven to here on earth. That's what we get to be a part of. And that's what our goal is, is to share that story and to be uh, the opportunity of sharing about the angels ascending and descending. And this is what it means. The latter is Jesus. He is the connection between heaven and earth. When we accept him as our savior, we now have the ability to see what has happened. Heaven perspective, right? Which is the eternal here on earth. We've been given that picture. And what a great picture it is. Because look at the response that Nathaniel has. Look at the response he has. When Jesus shared this, first, well, the, the very first thing Nathaniel said, he has is this skeptic view. Well, you know, who, how do I know who you are? He says, well, I mean, I saw, Jesus responds by saying, well, I saw you when you were under the fig tree even before Philip came to get you. And what's Nathaniel's, he's like, wait, I was by myself. There was nobody around. How would he know? Wow. He really is the son of God. And look at his response. His response is, you really are the son of God. You really are the king of Israel. You see, what, with that, we see the heart full of faith, right? We see the beautiful picture of, of this heart that is obedient to God. We see that is, is full of grace. And what does that do? It brings about life and an excitement, all because of who Jesus is in us as followers of him. And it gives us the ability to receive the word as truth. You see, you and I can go and, and share about this word, but until someone believes it, it's only going to be words on a page. But as a follower of Christ, we see the perspective of heaven on earth, and we see this perspective of angels ascending and ascending. Again, is the picture of eternal perspective. We see things differently as followers of Christ because of what Jesus has done for us. May we not forget what Jesus has done for us. Because the way that we go about living our lives is how do we respond to this? Well, as followers of Jesus, we are called to be messengers of the good news. That's how we respond. Tell people, wherever you are, 
as an opportunity. I've heard that it, it's shared that uh, the perspective person, it takes them, it takes them uh, seven times to hear the gospel before they believe it. An average person takes to hear the gospel seven times before they believe it for the first time. We don't know what number we are based off of that. But don't you want to be a part of someone coming to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ because you are? As a follower of Jesus, we are called to share that good news. Let's pray. Father, we are so grateful and so thankful to be able to, to share this opportunity of, of diving into your word and coming to know you as Savior and as Lord. Father, as, as we follow you, may we be the ones who are called to be the messenger of those good news and be that to share with every person that we come in contact with. We want to give you honor and praise for it because you deserve it. You deserve all the honor and praise. So Father, as we leave this place, may we be reminded of the great love that you have for us. And then while we were still sinners, you died for us. Amen.